we can go ahead and get started. Uh, usual format, names, pronouns, icebreaker, which for today will be, I guess, to kind of lighten the mood before we get in such a heavy book. Um, what do you consider to be your queer anthem song? And I will go first. Um, name is Jonathan, pronouns he, him. My queer anthem, I'm torn. Uh, I think either It's Raining Men by the Weather Girls, that's a really good one, or Mariah Carey Fantasy. Um, that's not really a gay song, but like Mariah Carey is pretty gay, so how could it not be? <laughs> what about you? Yeah, good. Uh, my name is Michael. I use he, him pronouns. Um, <clears throat> I don't really listen to a whole, whole lot of music. Um, mm -hmm. At least not, not intentionally. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't... I don't know if I have like a good queer anthem song um, putting me <laughs> putting me on the spot. Um, I do so I do one artist that I have uh, I'll, I'll give a few responses. One artist I've really drew in the past is uh, Sufjan Stevens, and I mm -hmm. I like a lot of his songs. I didn't even realize that he was queer um, until his most recent album. Um, so uh, I, I like some of the songs on that album there's one uh i think it's like will anybody ever love me it's kind of it's very sad but kind of a nice like queer um queer, queer coded song um do i have a happier answer than that <laughs> <laughs> um do I? you know that's okay oh okay, no oh pressure. um <laughs> there is you you may laugh at me for this um so there is a, a Whitney Houston song that Sam Smith did a cover of, and I thought it was, um, I just, oh, this is gonna go on YouTube. I may get dragged for this, it's fine, no one did see it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was the Sam Smith original. It's the, like, how will I know? Uh, really? <laughs> yes, for like, for years until, you know, I don't I don't really go out a lot, but I heard it at a <laughs> at a club one night, and I was like, oh, this sounds like Whitney Houston singing that Sam Smith song. So I was like, no, it, it is Whitney Houston. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, that actually, I'll I'll use that one. That is a good one for me. Okay, I won't drag you, but if it was February, I would, because that's like really important <laughs> Black history. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, well, I guess to get into heavier topics, uh, what did you think of Confessions of a Mask by Yukio Mishima? Um. To be honest, I didn't really like it, and I found it really hard to read. Um, <laughs> and I like very, especially towards the end, like the last maybe third of the book. I just just mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I like I couldn't like. I think maybe I just I'd like reach my limit, and I was like not giving it the attention <laughs> I probably should have, and it was just like how close am I to the end? Mm -hmm. um, I do. Uh, I do think for me it was like nice to see um, or or read through a story I haven't really read through before uh, of being like in like in that wartime era Japan um, and just like some of the uh, like like oddities um, of of his childhood in particular. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, those are my those are my general thoughts. What did you What did you think of this one? I guess I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum of you. Really? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'll say I didn't love it. I mean, I don't think I've loved really any of the books you've read, like wholeheartedly loved. But I actually, the more I think about it, the more I enjoyed it. I will say, I think, like I shared with you on Discord, um, that. In the beginning, I wasn't feeling it at all. It took a while to kind of find a groove in the story for me. Um, I wasn't as engaged as I would have liked to have been or that I have been with previous books we've read in the beginning. Um, but as the story went on and as, as things kind of developed, I guess I found an appreciation for it. I mean, I will say that I am not someone who I think I've shared before, I'm not someone who ever really tried to play into the straight, the, like the heterosexual life. I've never done that before. So it's kind of interesting to read from the 
the mindset of someone who is trying to do that um, and how hard that is for them. Also, like you mentioned, I, of course, haven't lived through a wartime, nor have I read many wartime stories, so it's interesting to get that as well. Um, but I think I'm able to appreciate that it's not a typical story. I'm not even sure what I would call it. I mean, it teeters the lines of like fiction and memoir, but I think this story doesn't really have a story if that makes any sense. It's just kind of like one person's thoughts for a certain period of their life and then it's over. Yeah. Um, like there's really no large conflict, there's no resolution. Uh, which is funny because I know in our past book, reading this one after the previous book, uh, Life from Uncommon Stars, that had like 20 characters, this book basically only has like two, <laughs> which is funny. But I have a certain appreciation for it. I mean, I definitely wouldn't read it again, but I think, I don't even know if I'd recommend it because it's so, it's a lot, but I have yeah. appreciation for it. I'll leave it there. I appreciate the yeah. book. <laughs> I, I will say in general, like I, I, I appreciated like the story and what you once you mentioned how it's not, not necessarily like written like a like quote unquote like, like book where it has like some like like major arc and resolution and and all of this, um, but just like the writing style, I it was mm -hmm. very very difficult for me, especially as like mm -hmm. I already have a lot of <laughs> a lot of trouble like keeping my attention, and then to like <laughs> be able to keep my attention long enough. And then the story is like, I was walking down the sidewalk and the sky was blue. The blue reminded me of my grandmother's jewelry, but sometimes other people wear jewelry. And then like once, <laughs> once I saw a clown and then like, and then I completely forgot that we were walking down the sidewalk. And then like two pages mm -hmm. later, um, it's like, and then I took another step forward. And I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that that in particular made it made it difficult for me, but I did, I, I did appreciate the story. But at the same time, like this is very much probably like, um at, at least for me feels like you know like pretty like normal like like a train of thought like how how things are going um that i i may have that like similar mm -hmm. uh you know like similar tendency to like you know, like ramble or like think about 19 different things that seem unrelated in the moment um mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh it was not not easy for me to read and that 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 was the big reason but mm -hmm. It's funny you mentioned that because that's a, a common complaint that even I hear, I've seen online, I haven't heard, but seen online, even amongst people who really enjoy the book, they do complain about the writing style. Um, and a lot of people attribute it to the translation. Um, the book, of course, was originally written in Japanese, um, and I don't speak Japanese, so I don't know how exactly the book is meant to be read, but people do think that I guess primarily with Yukio Mishima's works, there are three main translators that I guess are trusted with his works to translate them into English. And two of them are really good. And then this one, the one who translated this novel, apparently like kind of put his own flair on it. So I'm not sure if what we're reading is exactly what Yuki, Yukio Mishima meant for us to read. Um, I don't speak Japanese, so I'll never have an answer to that question, but it's a very high possibility. Read, yeah, I didn't think about that. Um, I don't. Is this the first book that we've read that's been translated? Um, I believe so. I do know that our next book, uh, "Love of Singular Men," is also a translation from Portuguese to English. But I think this is our first translation. Yes. Um. Do you know that this book was published in like 1950s? Is that right? 48 or 49 yeah late 40s it's an old book it's almost 80 years old wow. yeah <laughs> and funny enough my library only had one copy of it and it is like tattered to shreds like pages falling apart the spine is totally torn like so oh. it has definitely gotten its its wear <laughs> you um i didn't i didn't i didn't do um much much research into the history but do you know if this is really like a uh especially for for the time that it was published do you know when it was translated i'm asking you questions i can just google i'm literally sitting at a computer um translation you know when, when, yeah 
Um, I know it was originally reviewed in the New York Times in, I think, 51. So it may have been sometime around there. Um, yeah, it was around that time period, I believe. Either mid to early 50s or possibly early 60s around that time period. Mm -hmm. I'm curious now. I have, I have some research to do, but I'm very curious on the like uh, reception of this at the time. Not great. <laughs> I, I kind of figured. Um, yeah. That is where I want to go at uh, a little bit later towards the end of the book, because I mean, I do think that this book, considering, I will say the the mental state and possibly the questionable sanity of Cochan, I'm curious if this book could be used to. Uh, to kind of demonize homosexuality as us all being these like sick, you know, sadistic people. Um, yeah. And I read some reviews from when it was originally translated in the 50s, and they definitely do take that route. Um, so I don't know, but we'll get there. <laughs> First, I guess I'll ask in general, what did you think of Coach Ann as a character? Um. I mean, I, I think as a character, there are a lot of things that are easy to relate to um, mm -hmm. as a as a queer person or even just as like a um, any any sort of like, especially because so much of the book is like in in childhood, um, mm -hmm. which I think we've seen in some some of the other stories, too, of just like, a, you know, uh, an author trying to like, you know, re reverse work through like why why their childhood felt so uh, odd or, or othered. Um, so that, I mean, that's always like nice to see and to see someone exploring. Um, I was, uh, I guess, and again, like maybe this has to do with the time period, but like the, um, like the sickness and all of like the health issues Mm -hmm. to me felt like really strange the way that it was dealt with. And I'm just like, how, <laughs> yeah. how, how would you survive? But again, I guess like if I put it in the, in like the frame of the time period that like this, I guess this was just like how, how things were dealt with, um, especially like seeing some of the, the medical diagnosis and they're like, well, like, we're not really sure. We'll just like say it's this. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering like if, if the character had been a child in like a more, a more modern day, like how, how different would the story be because they wouldn't be like stuck in the house and not able to do anything. Um, and how much that really probably, I mean, it, well, it definitely affected all of their like social, social development, but uh, yeah, I don't know. So that, that the, the health issues and the, the way it like forms the character was a, really, really interesting piece for me. Um, I don't know, towards, I I don't have as many, as many thoughts. Oh, well, I do have some thoughts towards the end, but I don't have as many like strong thoughts towards the end. Uh, again, because I just kind of was like, <laughs> not not giving it the, the full attention that I should have, <laughs> uh, but yeah, what do you, what, do, what about you, Jonathan? I think, um, Coach Han, I mean, I'm trying my best to remain non-judgmental, um, but I think there is a lot to judge. Um, I think you're right. I definitely, of course, especially going to his childhood, I found certain moments to be relatable. Um, I found truth to some of the things he was saying. I know I shared a quote from the book in Discord. That quote for me, like, perfectly summed up the queer experience. Um, so, of course, that stood out to me a lot. Um, but I also found Coach Han to be very scary um, when we discussed his desires, like his sexual desires. Um, and of course, the book is not a, a horror story, but in those moments where he's like going over his like sexual fantasies, I was like, this is very much like a Dahmer-esque kind of like story that I wouldn't read if I would have known it went this far. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, which I do um, sort of on that same note, one of the notes I had was that like, especially earlier in the book, the way he mm -hmm. talks about a lot of these things um, 
it like fluctuates between like being very clinical and then being like very very poetic um mm-hmm. or or sometimes both at the same time um and i just i that just it really stuck out to me because i think like in um you know in in those moments where he he's like talking about sexual desires or like some of the experiences um the language really really seemed to like shift a little bit um mm. I know there's like a scene where he is, uh, you know, like like at at the beach, uh, and, yeah. is, and then like he says something, and it's like it says like 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 uh, oh my god, like like spermazoa or something, and I'm like, where did this come mm. from? And then like the next slide <laughs> talks about like like the the froth of the waves and like washing over me and like pulling pulling you know my uncleanliness away, and it that that scene in particular, I was like, this is exactly what I was like picking up in, in some of the other the other parts where it goes from very much like this is this is a this is a body and then this is like this like i don't know po- poetic magical mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh for, forbidden thing did you pick up on that at all or or notice any differences in the language talking about talking about some of those things compared to the language in you know the rest of the story yes i will say that especially when we discuss his sexual desires in the story, I think there's a very intense amount of self-loathing and, like, shame um, around his desires. I mean, I'm not going to say someone should be proud to have the certain desires that Cochan has, but I think when we begin to call, as an adult, we call masturbation a bad habit, and you call your genitals a toy, I'm like, that is very... I don't know. I don't know how healthy that is for the psyche of an adult. Um yeah. So there's a lot of shame there. And it's it's funny that you mentioned that because it's like he only really has those. He only discusses his own sexual desires in his own body that way. He doesn't do that with other people's bodies. Because um, I think of when he describes uh, seeing naked men, he doesn't talk about their quote unquote toy or their bad habits or, you know, um, he only calls them. He only uses those phrases for himself. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of self-loathing, a lot of self-hate going on there. But I also, I have to say that I think that's purely a result of growing up in probably what was a very repressed culture. I mean, I have never lived in Japan. I'm not Japanese, so I'm not going to speak on their relationship to sex and sexual desires. But I guess the stereotype uh, is that they are very strict and very conservative. Um, and I can also imagine being in the... Kochan's childhood takes place in like I think the 20s, yeah, the 20s. So I could imagine there, like, definitely that was not something like masturbation was not a topic that you talk about with your family. Yeah. Um, so I guess it makes sense why he's so repressed. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess when we're talking about his sexual desires, what did you think of Kochan's attraction to the hypermasculine? Or did you even notice that as being important? Oh no, no, I noticed it, and actually, um, this was also one of my one of my notes was, um, and I don't, maybe this is like, because this is like a thing that I, I don't particularly find, find myself attracted to, and this may also be like part of, part of the time period. Um, but there definitely is like such a strong focus on like a very, very mm-hmm. specific, like type of, type of physical form. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also noticed, I don't know if you, caught this or not but there is like a lot of emphasis on like the whiteness and part of this may be like some, yes. stuff, <laughs> some stuff we talk about at work because like we we do like a lot of these equity trainings um because i've mm-hmm. lived in a you know, majority uh people of color city work in a majority people of color school district um so you know we often talk to talk about like proximity to whiteness and the whole time he's like talking to all these people and he's like he's like beautiful his beautiful white skin and his beautiful mm-hmm. white hands and i'm like we're we're in Japan, like eighty years ago, I know, I know these people were not white. <laughs> um, but I don't. I part of me is curious if that is like some projection of like literature or um, you know, like culture or or media at the time uh, of like what is what is desirable and him and coaching transferring that onto onto the people around him, even if it's not really there. 
Uh, but yes, I, I definitely picked up on this, like, you know, he wants like the, like Adonis, like the, like, like mm-hmm. image of like the, <laughs> I, don't, I don't, I don't want to say like white, white Jesus, but like that, <laughs> you know, like, like shirtless loincloth, pale skinned six pack. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um but yes i did i i did i did pick that up and i did uh i don't know i found it i found it very interesting especially because um you know Cochan's own body is frail and tiny and feeble um mm-hmm. and just i from from the descriptions i mean i don't know that we get like a super detailed description but i mean like there's a part where they're like weighing him and he's like 80 80 pounds and he's a teenager and i'm like mm-hmm. mm, this is like you're a, a, a wisp of a, of a person <laughs> um so i don't i don't know if that's part of it too like i i know there is some point where he like mentions um especially when he's talking about omi like having having some like desires for his body to to be sort of like omi's but um i don't i don't recall like him actually like pursuing that in in depth or like that actually happening for him. It's interesting that you bring up um, the connection between his own, as he describes it, weak body and his attraction to the hypermasculine, because that was something I noticed as well. Um, I think there's definitely a connection there. I think a lot of it, at least to me, read like his attraction to the hypermasculine or to these like really strong men. Uh, is almost like a sort of jealousy or like envy, like that's the body he wishes he had, um, which is, again I think relates to his self-loathing simply because that's what he thinks a man should be, and because he's the total opposite, it's like he doesn't feel masculine or manly. Um, so yeah, and it's funny you bring up the whiteness because I guess I didn't really notice it as much, but when you talk about it, I'm thinking obviously they're not literally white people but i'm thinking maybe he's describing like a certain sense of purity about them um because they're all young and especially with sunoko at least the boys i don't know if they're virgins or not but majority of the people he's talking about are virginal um maybe he's talking about a certain sense of purity not literally white skin um i don't know it's interesting Yeah, I didn't. I didn't think about like the purity aspect, especially because they are. They are. They are children for most mm-hmm. of the um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I will say the one. The Omi in particular, though, one of the first mm-hmm. things we get about him is like this rumor that he's like had sex with a lot of girls. So. Mm-hmm. That. That's a good part for for that character, at least. I don't know if that applies. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, maybe it still does. It's just a rumor. We don't know. <laughs> and I guess I'm curious. Did you notice that in Cochan's childhood, especially that he was essentially conditioned or raised as a girl, like only being allowed to play inside, being made to play very gently? only being allowed to play with other girls um, as opposed to with boys his own age, and then not even being allowed to stay at the boarding school with the boys. Um, Did you notice that? And I guess my follow-up to that is, do you think that's the author speaking to homosexuality in young boys being more nurture than nature? Uh, I did. I did notice that there is uh, from like a social aspect, um, not like the the level of connection a lot of his peers have at any at any point in the story um Mm -hmm. of things that would just like you know seem seem pretty normal for someone in those same situations um and it also makes me wonder like is part of that like in an awareness from his family is is it like the majority related to um his his health and like physical well-being uh, and like an assumption to try and take care of that, but um, no, I did. I did notice that. And there's one point in the book where uh, he's specifically talking about um, like like men and women, and says that like 
you know, women, women are more, are more shy and like men are more like, uh, men are more like this. And sometimes you like try and meet in the middle and you go like too far in opposite directions. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just thought like, like what, what a number one, like what, what a base level, like (laughs) description of like what, what men and women are. But, um, if that really is how he, you know, views, views gender, then like, I could, I could definitely see that too. Like, it, he's almost he doesn't explicitly say it but is like sort of acknowledging like oh yes like I definitely like fit more into like the the feminine and I am like very very well aware of that um even even if I don't want to outwardly acknowledge it mm-hmm. and that's a really good point because that's what I was thinking as well it it did kind of give me that image that like he's trying to say that homosexuality is like nurture but I guess There is, again, the quote that I posted in Discord where he's saying, like, when I go around certain family, I'm required to act more masculine or more like a boy, quote unquote, um, than when I'm at home with my, like, immediate family. Um, And that's his true nature is the feminine, the, you know, liking to play with girls, all that kind of stuff. Um, And yeah, and then it also ties into the part where he begins to kind of get interested in, like, dressing women's clothing. that to me read more like a interest in drag. I don't even know if drag existed at that time period in the 20s, but that was more an interest in drag to me. Did that read to you as like drag or actually wanting to be a woman? Um, I mean, I don't think that I really read at any part in the story or interpreted that um, he like wanted wanted to be a woman. I think it was just more like probably more along the lines of what you're saying of not and you know maybe maybe it is more like interest in drag but just uh you know an an exploration of like what is like what what is what is gender and and representation and presentation to me um Mm -hmm. and and that it can be i don't and and probably trying to understand like how it can be i don't i don't i don't want to say flexed but um Mm -hmm. like how it can be individualized in a way that probably well we know definitely was not uh you know okay in early 1900s japan Mm -hmm. yeah and i think that part where he begins to dress uh dress as these like female actors or performers that he's seeing um that then kind of ties into the overarching theme of the story of like putting on a performance or of course as the title suggests putting on a mask um and that's interesting because as I looked more into Yukio Mishima and did, you know, research on who he is as a person and his, his life and all those kind of things, I realized his real name isn't even Yukio Mishima. Uh, that's his pen name. So essentially, yeah. everything in his stories are just kind of like a character. Um, and I don't know, I just thought that was so interesting. Uh, did you notice that in the story, like this overarching theme of performing in life? Um, I, I think to some extent, and we get, uh, a lot of, I'm sorry if it's very loud, it also, uh, happens to be Fleet Week here, so there are, like, military <laughs> zooming, zooming over the city, and it's very loud all day, um. It's on theme for a war storybook. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I completely forgot, uh, and the other day I was like, I swear I just saw like some military planes like drive by it or not drive by fly by in the middle of the city Uh, and actually it it really freaked me out um and then they were like and then they started getting loud and like going really fast I was like oh it's it's like the thing um every year I forget it happens um but anyway sorry I just there it's okay (laughs) way way to uh, completely distract myself um and now I forgot what your question was uh, oh, it was, um, did you notice the overarching theme of having to perform in life as opposed to, like, being yourself? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that a lot of um, what what we see is very, very performative. Um, mm-hmm. And things, I don't know, a lot, a lot of things, because we, like, get this, you know, like, internal, internal monologue and, like, really understanding um, you know, kind of was like thinking and then like sometimes uh like what actually 
happens doesn't necessarily align with that or it feels like there's a lot of like like build up to it um i think in uh even like there's like a scene when he's in school and well there are a few that come to mind um one where he's in school and he's like doing that log thing with omi and like this is like absolutely not like who you are what you what you would be doing um it just feels like purely for like the like entertainment of of the crowd and like some like performative thing to like try and try and be closer to omi in that moment um Mm -hmm. and definitely some some things too when he's like younger and and older i mean on both both sides of that um sort of like similar similar situations are there any specific scenes that stick out to you where you where you see this trend or do you see it more in certain parts of the book than in others i think for me it's prevalent throughout the entire story but it's most obvious to me with his relationship with sunoko um he is consistently trying to give her the impression that he's courting her when even he knows himself, like, I don't want her in that way. And I never will. Um, But he's willing to kind of put on this show, especially for her family. Like he mostly does these things around her family. Um, And it's like, what's the point if you know your true desire is not her? I mean, obviously, yes, he wouldn't have been allowed to be in an openly queer relationship. So in a way I can understand that, but it's like, why pretend so intensely? and yeah, it's, just, it's all very performative, in my opinion. Did you notice that in his relationship with Sunoko at all? Uh, you, yes, it, it very uh, exactly what you said. Very, very performative. Mm-hmm. Um, very much. I don't. I was like over overcompensating, but like, um, yeah, it's just it's not. It's not who he really is. Mm-hmm. And I do kind of want to go back to something you said earlier in our conversation. You mentioned that uh, his thoughts are very scattered and like, you know, uh, none of the book is not really linear. It's just kind of like all over the place. I'm curious, knowing that this book was published in the late 40s, which was prior to the first edition of the DSM, which is like how people diagnose mental illnesses. Do you think that any of the characters are like suffering from mental illness Um, in this story? Probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I don't know, I don't want to like, you know, like prescribe like mental illness onto any of the mm-hmm. um, characters, especially again, like we know this, like a very, very, uh, you know, strict and, you know, fairly, fairly repressed culture, um, you know, operating, we're assuming most of the story set literally a hundred years ago. Um, mm-hmm which like here we have like people that were like li- literally had been slaves were like still like trying to figure out what to like what to do and how to like live life 100 years ago um so i don't know like uh try trying to put it in that in that time frame makes me like question some of what what we may interpret there but um yeah like the the lines of thought for no, in particular, I'm just kind of like, uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe a little, a little somewhere on some, 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 some sort of diagnosis. I'm not, I'm not sure what, um, but yes, I do. I, I do agree with that. Um, especially some, some of his family members, the actions. It, yes, yes. <laughs> not like, it's easy to like chalk it up and say they're, they're eccentric, but, um, <laughs> Yeah. It may be it may be a little bit more than that. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Like, I'm I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not going to, you know, diagnose these fictional characters or maybe even semi-real characters I've never met. But I definitely noticed it with his grandmother. She is extremely, extremely paranoid. Um, and I guess just working in uh working in health period, I have at least a modicum of understanding of mental illnesses. And it definitely reads to me as schizophrenia. It's like yeah. really, really intense to where it's like, and it's also mostly unfounded. Um, and yeah, and I was, I'm just curious, did any of that rub off on Coach Han? Uh, because he is just so, I guess I would say like repressed is probably the best term, but 
maybe even tortured. And I'm wondering if, like, did that affect him, too? I would think it would have to because he grew up with her for most of his life, but... Yeah. yeah. Do you um do you remember this scene with the parade? Yes. Um one of the questions I had is like at at the culmination of that um when like the parade I guess like crashes crashes through their yard um mm. I <laughs> did he he said that they were like all drunk and I just like I don't. That was like one of one of those scenes that makes me question exactly exactly what you're asking. Um, you know, if there's like an underlying like hint hint of mental mental illness or something in there, because just like that whole that whole scene felt like a little a little bit of a fever dream to me, um, mm. or just like it didn't it didn't feel as coherent as some other parts of the book. And then for it to end, like I mean, like he's a child. How does he know? <laughs> how does he know if they're they're drunk or not and just like the the energy and excitement and culmination there was um I don't know, it was really really interesting and bizarre and some of his reactions i think this is one of the places where he uh first mentions that like uh you know i just i just get anxious and run away and that's like that's how i deal with situations <laughs> um and we we see that like very very clearly happen there but did do you have any any thoughts about that particular scene, or do you do you see it relate to maybe your question about mental illness, or or even with like the grandmother and like possible like like schizophrenia? It says that she like called the fire department and had them reroute the parade by her house because she didn't want to yeah. like. Get, <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, it's funny you bring that up because that is, I think, one of the titular scenes that establishes that. I'm not sure if Cochan is necessarily a reliable narrator. Um, it kind of seems as if he tends to mix intense fantasy with like what his reality is, yeah. and oftentimes even romanticizes his reality um, to where it's like a, there are several moments where I'm not totally sure what is real or like what is just his perception of things, especially yeah. because in the story, like we. <sighs> We only learn about things from his perspective and like what he what his thoughts are. We don't know anything else. So who are we to say that he is like telling the truth or that he's remembering things correctly, especially when he's calling back to like very, very early parts of his childhood? Like, well, how do you remember that totally? Um, yeah. yeah. And I think like and this I, scene. Go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. I would say this scene, too, is one where he like is. Also, just like I, I don't want to say like like in, intoxicated but just like mm -hmm. like so hyper focused on this like physical um almost like sexual aspect of some of the people in the parade that i'm like i don't like exactly what you're saying like i don't i don't know what's real and what is like what is just him like being being caught up in a moment that he may not be fully understanding or fully um like like present in uh because it's just like one one piece is pulling all of his attention. Mm. I'm glad you said it because that's exactly where I was going to go. Um, that is like not his first, I guess, sexual awakening. I think the first one is uh, where he is like enamored with that man who is essentially like a manure transporter. I don't know what kind of role that is, but a guy who like, I don't know, delivers manure to people. Um, yeah. But this scene is a pretty, I guess, like, a uh, early sexual awakening for him. And I'm curious, He, this is when he kind of begins to talk about, like, the death of these men and, like, how he can fantasize about their dead bodies in war and, like, dead bodies in the street. And I'm curious, with that whole, I guess, sexualization of death, would you consider that to be, like, a kink or, like, sexual perversion? Uh, Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um I I I think a little bit of both or maybe maybe a lot of both. Um because mm -hmm. especially we see like some really more extreme things later in the story. Yeah. Um <laughs> where like it it obviously is like at some at some level like a, a kink or a really really extreme sexual desire that he like can't can't separate himself from um 
Yeah, I don't know what what I guess what is the what is the dividing line between between kink and and perversion? Yeah, <laughs> that, that will help me answer that question. Um, which I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I I guess perversion to me, I think, is something. I mean, becoming like a, a crime or intentional intentional harm against someone else's will, which obviously, like a lot of these things are. Um, so yeah, I mean, yes, I guess, I guess it is, it is, it is still both, but more, more on the side of perversion. Yeah, I have to agree. I mean, you pose a really great question. Where do you draw that line? I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I have no clue. But uh, I will say yes. It reads more like sexual perversion, especially because he's really interested in the death and like torture of these young men it's not like oh they just have really great bodies and you know i want to sleep with them it's like no i want to torture and kill these people um which i don't know if that would be considered a kink i mean i'm not an expert on the world of kink but from what i understand that's not one of them um <laughs> so yeah i'd probably say more perversion and i guess i'm curious a follow-up question to that question is do you think that coach hands Cochan consistently being excluded from the the hyper masculine life and like being around masculine people. Do you think that it has any connection to his desires to torture those who are masculine? Uh, I mean, I I think so, and I think that part of that too is like really just related to what is being ingrained in him from like a societal perspective, or like what what is idealized and like what is. Like what? It, what is "quote unquote" man, um, and that you know, like that equates to power in some way, um, and that for him is like an inattainable way to to achieve that. Uh, when there there are a lot of other ways that are not not attainable or accessible for him. Mm. Do you do you feel the same way, or have? Um, Like any, I don't any any other any other thoughts there. Yeah, I mean, I I definitely agree with you there. I I think that it. I, I think I said earlier, it just totally reads as jealousy to me. And like you're punishing people for you're punishing those who have what you want for what you don't have. Um, yeah. And yeah, and that's what, I guess what was most difficult for me. It's like he keeps. He keeps describing these feelings as like, oh, I just have lust or I just have these thoughts of this pleasure. But it's like, well, you want to torture people. I think that's different than like a sexual desire. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Do you um, think that Otan sees any future for himself where he can ever be happy? That's what I was going to ask later on. It's just... I. No, I think because during Coach Han's adult life, it's like the late 40s, early 50s when the war ends. Um, I don't think that queer people in those times really even saw any sort of future where you could be openly queer. I don't think that was on their minds, especially in non-American countries. Because um, I know that I guess the discussion of queer rights in the 50s and 60s were bubbling, but in other countries, I don't, I don't even know if they consider that to be a possibility one day. Um, yeah. Which is why I, I think that Cochan is consistently fantasizing about being killed either during an air raid, like a, a bomb or an air raid, or even going to war and being killed. It's like that's his, I guess that's his way out because he can't see himself ever being happy, so he might as well just die. Um, Cause it's almost like he's not really doing anything to save his life. He's just like hoping he'll die. Cause he doesn't even have any plans for his future. He's just like taking each day at a time. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't, so yeah, I mean like, why, what do you think? Why, why would he have plans for his future? Like what is there Yeah. for him to like look forward to be excited about? I think also just knowing how he just feels no attraction to women whatsoever, even Yes, not sexually, but even like romantically, just no attraction whatsoever. And I think for him, he understands that 
eventually I'll have to be with a woman and more than likely marry a woman. Um, and there's just no pleasure in that for him at all. So it's like, what's the point? Like you said, what's the point of planning a future or even having hope for the future? Because that, that is your future. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good question. Though. <laughs> I'm curious, did you notice any significance in uh, Cochan's school's like adolescent game of what he calls dirty? Um, and did you do you think that's like the author's attempts to like call out the homoeroticism in young men and like how homoerotic, I guess, settings with all boys can be? Um, I, I did think it was very, very strange. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and also, I was like, I was trying to think whenever that I was like, did we, did I do anything like this as a child? I don't think I did. <laughs> um, and I don't, I don't know if there is like some, like removal, uh, from myself, like by myself from from some of those spaces, like knowing, uh, at some level as a kid that I that I I was queer, um, or, or just maybe I like socially was not like in in those spaces in the same way, but. Yeah, it felt it. It felt very, uh, <laughs> very, uh, very strange. Yeah, uh, but yeah. I do like a lot of, and a lot of the things that are in in the book of these like hyper masculine all male spaces, like an all male boarding school, um, any any sort of like military thing, are are very homoerotic in a lot of ways. Um, and I do, <clears throat> I I do think that maybe. At some level, he was like trying to, like draw draw attention to that. Um, but I don't I I don't necessarily know like if there was, like like an an end game to pointing that out, or if there is like a. I don't know, like a like a like a nice conclusion from that. Did you, did you have one or pick up anything anything different? No, I mean. Yeah. You, you, what you're saying totally mirrors my own thoughts. It was definitely very strange. Although I do have to say, I remember being a child and while I didn't play those games, I know they were on the schoolyard. Um, and then even now I still see amongst only heterosexual men, this like homoerotic, like thinking that like joking about sleeping with your friends is funny, thinking about joking about oral sex with men is funny. Like what's the what's the comedy in that? I just don't really, <laughs> I don't know. And sometimes I guess a bit of a tangent, but I guess it makes me think if you're consistently wanting to joke that way, at what point does the joke become what you really want to do? Um, and maybe you're denying your your desires by calling it a joke. Um, which is why I think the author is trying to get at there. And also I think it's funny because Kochan was not interested in playing that game at all until he realized he could potentially touch Omi during that game. And then he like wants to play so bad. Um, but he also doesn't want to seem too eager because while you want to play the game, you don't want to seem like you want to touch somebody's penis, but obviously you do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. And I guess a follow-up to that question is, do you notice any connection between the game of dirty? The whole object is for to like is to catch someone by surprise and to obviously not have their consent to touch them that way. Do you make a connection between that and all of Cochan's sexual fantasies totally being devoid of consent, actually to the point to where his sexual fantasies involve the men like not wanting it at all or like even begging for him to stop? Do you notice a connection there at all? Um. I, I didn't, but I do now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there is a there. There is definitely some sort of like through line with a lot of these things, and um, you know, I think what we we see now and really easily recognize is the idea of consent. Um, mm -hmm. And again, like I don't know how much of this is like tied to tied to like cultural norms or um you know like gender gender roles of the time that like i don't know like how much how much consent did did his mother have in like marrying his father or like bearing mm -hmm. three children or each other that is a whole nother point for me like he has a brother and sister that i 
I think I mentioned like three times in the story. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just am like, oh yeah. He like has like a real, a whole like real family and just does not spend any time with them or have any relationship with them at all. Mm-hmm. Um, meanwhile, they are like a thriving, well, I don't know if they're thriving, but like a, like a nice little unit just without, without him there, um, mm-hmm. which was also strange to me, but um, <laughs> Sorry, before before I get on too many tangents. Um, yeah, I don't know, like how much of the idea of just like taking what you want with or without consent is is tied to it just being like Japan a hundred years ago, um, and how much of it is something something internal in in Kochan uh, or. Well, I mean, I guess in this case, it's not really internal because it's like the whole school doing it. But, um, but there, there obviously is like some some internal piece for him too, where he is like trying to just like get get whatever he wants and and doesn't care. Uh, I don't know. I thought I had like a nice like little thought to wrap that up, but I don't think I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I, I agree with you. I think that there's definitely a connection there, especially because that is the the first time that Coach Han realizes he actually wants to like engage in this this sexual game, which is like where there's no consent at all. Um, and I would imagine that would have to influence his later on sexual desires. But you have a really great point. This the overall cultural understanding of consent and what that even looked like in 1920s Japan. I don't even know if the concept of consent was, you know, even there, but what would that have looked like? And then how much of that would have been influenced, like you say, by his own parents and like, you know, women's right to consent and whatnot. And I'm not going to go on that tangent, but there's a lot to be said there, I'm sure. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. And in that same breath, as he's talking about his relationships with, with other young men, he mentions that he thinks that queer men naturally have to be more introspective than heterosexual men as a means of survival. I'm curious, do you agree with that? Or do you, I guess, even notice that in your own life, this constant, this constant need, or I guess, I guess not constant need, but uh, this like natural inclination to be more introspective than like your straight counterparts as a means of survival? Um, I mean, I, I think so. I think that it probably is like a little bit less, less necessary, um, at least in in the society that I currently live in, um, than it may have been like when I, when I was a kid, but I do think that there is definitely a need to, um, I don't like take, take stock of the world around you and how you move through it and present yourself in it and how it how it responds to you in ways that uh like heterosexual men obviously aren't are doing or having to think about um because it is like largely designed by them and for them um so i do i do i do agree with it to to some extent um i don't obviously don't think it's like an end-all be-all um and it, it makes me think back to to like that that note I mentioned earlier where he's like talking about like you know like women need to be shy and men need to be this, but sometimes they go in the opposite direction. Um, so just it it's sort of like I wish I had the quote actually maybe it's one that I screenshot it. Um, I'll see if I'll see if I have it my thing. Uh, <laughs> I, did, I I took pictures of a lot of things, like especially things that don't make sense. Um, <laughs> that can be a that can that can be safe for a little a little bit later. But do you do you agree? Do you find that that like holds holds true for you? Do you think it is something that's still like today that like a a queer uh, we'll say male male identifying like person needs to exhibit in the same way? I will say I do agree. I'm not necessarily, I'm not a a teen or a child now, so I can't speak to how things are for them. But when I was a kid, very much yes. I mean, I remember having to be careful of the way I chose to act around certain people, especially other boys, 
the way I talked, you know, the tone of my voice, uh, you know, things like that, my interests, um, because I knew that essentially if I let my, I guess, cover or even mask to go with the theme of the book, let my mask slip, I could potentially be very unsafe. Um, and I think that's something I think a lot of queer people have in their lives. Um, and I think when you're straight, you don't have to do that because, well, yes, maybe your interests may be considered a bit weird or, you know, whatever, but the very core of you, your sexuality is not outside of the norm. Whereas I think with, with queer people, that is a fear we have, um, that straight people just don't. Um, and I guess to follow up that, I think you can be introspective to a fault because I think one of Coach Han's primary issues is overthinking. Um, it seems like for a lot of the story, his mind is just kind of spiraling, but it's like, well, no one told you to feel all these things. You're just kind of like letting your mind wander a little bit too much. Yeah. Like maybe take a break and you'll calm down. <laughs> You know, did you notice that overthinking at all in Coach Han's life at all? Uh, yes, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, even even about like sometimes just like the most minor yeah. minor things. Um, and I wish I had like a good example off the top of my head, but um, yes, it is a lot, a lot, a lot of overthinking. Um. And I don't know how much of that is tied to, uh, like, his actual personality mm-hmm. or, like, just who he is as a person and how much of it is tied to his queerness. Mm-hmm. Or mental illness. <laughs> yeah, mental illness. <laughs> and I guess now we have to kind of talk about Sunoko and that whole part of the story. I guess I'll ask, what did you think of Sunoko as a character? Um, I don't know that I really had any strong thoughts. Um, and I'll also openly admit this is like the part of the story where I was, which probably like one of the more important, more important parts of the story, but where I just was like starting to zone out <laughs> and be like, what, what is next? Um, I don't, I, I did find it strange how, um, he just so frequently is like, I, I don't know, it's like not not attracted to her, and there's like mm-hmm. not, yeah, <laughs> it's it's just like okay, it's a thing. Um, I don't I don't know if I could deal with that in the same way, but um, I also don't know if she really like had an option. Mm-hmm. But what do you what do you think of? I agree. I mean, there's really not, there's just not much of her to really have strong feelings about, but I will say that I felt bad for her. That it's, it seemed as if she was convinced he did actually want her, but just couldn't make up his mind. But little does she know, he's actually into men, not women. So you'll never have him the way you think you will. And it's unfortunate that he keeps lying to her, but I don't know. And it's a part of me is like, well, I guess I would think a woman of today, eventually your mind would begin to wonder, hmm, this man never seems to like me. Maybe he's not into women. But I think also, to her credit, in the 40s, that probably wasn't even something women were thinking about. Um, yeah. Because that wasn't a fear you had, I guess. And um, like, what other experiences does she have to, mm-hmm, true. Ba- to, to base it off of, right? Mm-hmm. Cause she's like a little bit younger than he is. And I think he's like essentially her first love interest. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess on that same, same thought, did you notice how, even though while he says he's developing these feelings for her and I use feelings in quotations because I don't think he has any for her really, but while he's doing that, uh, he's also describing her in the beginning as being a larger woman who's like not very attractive and there's a few times where he can he calls out other women who are prettier than she is. Um, did that stick out to you at all? Um, just just a little bit. I I don't feel like 
focus on uh, like how how troublesome that is uh, in so many so many ways. Um, but uh, I I kind of thought that maybe it was. His, I don't know. Um, I don't, I don't want to say like reminding her like you like you've been chosen like at least at least I'm here I could be somewhere else. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But that is I mean I don't know it's like kind of kind of pathetic and sad in its in its own way. Um, mm. What's up with it? But again, like what what does she have to go off of to know whether or not that's like something that she should do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I agree. I mean, I think for me that red is like he is consistently trying to justify why he doesn't find her attractive by saying, oh, well, she's not that pretty. And well, she's kind of large. And maybe if she was a little bit smaller, I would like her. If she was a little pretty, I would like her. But it's like, well, I don't think you like women at all. It's not her. <laughs> There's nothing she can do. Um, and yeah, that's what that red to, is, uh, red to me as. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll ask, this is like a a question I had throughout the entire book. Do you think it's possible to love someone, which Ko Chan claims he loves Sunoko, is it possible to love someone yet have no sexual attraction to them whatsoever? Uh, um, to, like, love them in a romantic way? Yeah. <laughs> like, to be in um, love with that person. <laughs> yeah it's a thing um <laughs> no it, I, i'm like more like reflect half reflect on personal experiences and half like <laughs> um i think like yeah, yes and no um i mean i think i think you can like have a lot of love for a person in that way uh mm. and maybe not have like that strong of an attraction, but I think that you cannot have, you know, at the end of the day, a like productive relationship if that's not if that's not part of it. Um, unless you are, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not an asexual person, so I can't really like speak on that experience. I think that that may be like the the exception there, like the case where that is like a more more uh expected thing but i think outside of that uh prob- probably no mm. not not completely not completely not fully not the way that uh you need to like be be successful mm. Mm. <laughs> i think i agree i've been thinking about that question since i finished the book but i think i agree i mean at least in my I, own personal experience I obviously enjoy sex. I'm not asexual, but it's not super important to me. So it's like, well, if we're not doing it, that's okay. <laughs> I don't know. But could I love someone without being attracted to them at all? I don't think I could. Yeah. But he believes he does, which again kind of goes to my next point is he's so insistent upon thinking that his love for Sonoko must be romantic, but it's like he never even considers that maybe you just really want to be her friend, and that's okay, too. <laughs> Did you notice that at all? Um, I I think that he's a little bit delusional and is, like, trying to trying to survive or, or justify what's going on. Um, mm-hmm. But, I mean, yeah, maybe maybe they should just be friends. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. Sometimes that's a hard, um, like prospect to to grapple with, especially if you I don't know, feel like like this is your your chance and your option. Like, how do you mm. how do you uh, like come come back once you've like crossed a certain threshold? Mm. That's a good point. I think in my mind, I was thinking, I think that, like, he'd make Sunoko a great GBF, but not a great husband. Um, 
So, yeah. And I guess I'm curious, do you consider... Do you consider it selfish that Kochan is so insistent upon making sure Sunoko loves him while also knowing he'll never return her affections? Do you consider that to be selfish? I, y- yes, it is selfish. Um, but I think this is another one of those things that I like put into the... Um, try like put in the context of, of the setting of the story. Mm-hmm. And remember, like this is like probably the norm that the man is like, you will, you will love me. I will have a job. Um, I can like go out and like have a mistress, and like it's not it's not as big of a deal, um, like that. That sort of like a, I, I was like a masculine ideal, but um. You know, this this idea of like what men like can can and cannot do and like what what is the role what is the role of a woman um and it, to to me that that felt like part of it but do you have other do you have other thoughts do you agree with that statement to any extent yeah that's actually a really great point i hadn't thought of i think you're right that uh traditionally especially in this time period it's not really expected of men to have romantic feelings towards a woman it's like well i'm a man you're a woman we like each other enough we get along well enough let's go ahead and go ahead, let's go ahead and get married and have children um, yeah. and that's kind of what he's doing um so you have a good, really good point and i guess to take it one step further i'm thinking would i consider it selfish for all the gay men who have obviously married women and had children with women uh in the 40s 50s even some still today would I consider that to be selfish if you're doing it for survival? Um, because we know it wouldn't have been socially acceptable for a man to be single within his well into his like 30s, 40s. Like people would think, okay, what's wrong with you? Yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have an answer to my own question, but <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> no, that's that's a good point. I didn't really consider the like survival survival aspect, especially um, like thinking thinking back to, to some of the other things, especially where he's like, I like get anxious and run away. And that's like, he's surprisingly not, not, not doing that here, but that's because he may not have another option. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of that read to me as survival. I'm just, I'm curious what in terms of their society, what would have been done had people known he was queer? Like, did they have laws against homosexuality? I know in America we did. Uh, it was outlawed, so I don't know what it was like in Japan and, like, what would have happened had he not been with a woman. Um, that would have been interesting to see, but, yeah. I'm curious, do you do you notice, like, in the story, Kochan's throughout the entire story, his his refusal to really grow up and, like, plan for his future. And I guess, do you correlate that to his understanding that as he gets older and accepts the fact that he doesn't like women sexually, that he'll have to then come to terms with his own sexuality? Like, that refusal to accept who he is, but also refusal to grow up? I, I, I definitely think the two are tied together. Um, mm-hmm. If you don't if you don't accept part of your reality, then you don't have to accept all of it, right? Like you mm-hmm. can't. Um, and again, like maybe this is some some level of um, delusion or or mental illness um, that's influencing that's influencing that. But um, yeah, no, definitely, I think that they are they are tied together. Uh, and it, but actually, that I'm going to make one of my notes tie into that. Um, because one one of the other notes I have is there is a part, um, especially talking about like his realizations that like he's not really attracted to women. Um, mm-hmm. Do you remember when he's talking about like the lady that drives the bus and he like says something about like her uniform is so tight, mm-hmm. and then starts to have this realization that like, oh like I don't I can like make these comments because I just like don't care about the way women look, whereas everyone else gets all like you know, hot, hot and bothered by it. Do you, do you remember that scene? 
Yes. Mm-hmm. There is a line in there where he, and this happens a few times in the book, uh, which is uh, another another discussion point where he like breaks the fourth wall and he says, I wonder if the reader understands what I'm trying to say after going <laughs> on some like crazy, crazy tangent. Um, <laughs> uh, that like, I feel like that, that kind of ties in here too. Like, uh, I don't know. I, he, I feel like he maybe doesn't understand or, or want to understand uh what what reality could be and that probably influences the writing style and the way the story is put together and and influences dear to like not you know not not growing up um and not like trying to like have any 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 plan for future um that's a little a little too a little too scary or like too too hard to confront mm-hmm. I don't know that all those things necessarily went together, but I tried to make them make sense and go together. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah, I I agree. I mean, I I do think there's a correlation there between the refusal to grow up and the refusal to accept who he really is. Um, and again, I think it ties back to our previous point. You know what? What kind of hope is there for for a queer person in this time period? Because I would highly doubt it would be taken well if he like came out and like was with other men and you know all those things so i guess it's like well why would you want to grow up into that realization you would just deny it forever um and even when even as we leave coach Ann, i'm not going to skip to the ending right now but even as we leave him in the story it's like he still is trying to make things with sunoko work even though she's married she's obviously moved on um, but he just can't seem to like let her go as his like security blanket or his like fallback plan for a woman, um, which I think ties to that same refusal to accept who he really is, or refusal to accept, a refusal to plan his future out, as opposed to living in the past. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I guess. While we're here, we might as well skip to the end because there's really not much else in the story that I think stood out to me. Uh, what did you think of the story's end? Do you think it really felt like an ending to a story at all? Um, yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I want to. I'll throw the question back on you. Um, <laughs> you you can you can answer first this time, and then I'll. <laughs> <want to>. okay. <laughs> what you, what you I think for me, it felt so strange. The story just kind of ends, um, and I've never really read a, a book where it's like there's no resolution. There's no okay. Here's what might happen next for me. Here's my next plan. It's like no, that's it. This is it. Um, and like I know I mentioned earlier, my library only has the one copy and it's like really beaten up. So I was thinking like, am I missing a few pages? Like, <laughs> this can't be the story's end, but it is. Um, and yeah, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, it, it felt like an unfinished memoir, which is interesting because I think I told I had mentioned in Discord that like so much of the book is heavily inspired or even directly taken out of the author's life. And I think if we're meant to take this as a memoir or as an autobiography, I think it's impossible to write an ending to a story that you're still living in. Uh, He finished this book, I think he was like 24 or 23. Um, So it kind of makes sense where you leave him. Like he's still kind of immature. He's still figuring things out because at that age, you are still immature and figuring things out. Um, So yeah, I mean, do you have any other thoughts to that? you want to share um (laughs) no i mean i agree that it did feel unfinished and it did feel kind of like weird but i also try to think like what 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 could have been next or like where where could it have ended um Mm -hmm. without it being you know as much as i um don't love like a super a super neat ending um (laughs) 
I also like the this was very far on the other end of the spectrum, um, <laughs> probably to the point of me also also not um, loving it. But mm. uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I guess I'll ask, after reading the entire story, would you actually consider Cochan to be queer, or would you consider him to be something different? Um, I, I think I still consider him to be queer. I think there's a there are some points like as he gets a little bit older where that identity shifts maybe more from queer to i don't i don't want to say like monstrous but Mm -hmm. um like it shifts out of being uh just like a a desire outside the like societal norm to being uh like something kind of like harmful and evil and i don't know that i want to like <laughs> label, label label that as queer uh as much as label it as like disturbed um mm-hmm. or or something along those lines mm-hmm. um yeah but i think they're they're like it's definitely um uh, like a spectrum and at some point he like goes goes off the spectrum in like a, a, a different direction off the off the page <laughs> um and, it, and it, I, I do i do think it's gradual and like they're they're it like you know leads, leads up to it but um beginning of the book yes middle of the book yes end of the book no <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I mean, there were definitely times where I was like, oh, this guy is definitely gay. And then as we go on, I'm like, oh, maybe he's bisexual. And then at the end, I'm like, mm, I don't know if he's either, simply because we've been thinking yeah. back to his sexual fantasies of young men. There's no actual sex being had, um, nor does he ever express a desire to have sex with other men in real life. Um, it's purely torture. Um, yeah. And I'm like, is that sex i don't or is that i guess is that a sexuality i i don't know um uh, it made me think of monstrulio a little bit yeah um, <laughs> that, i mean that that is like a, a large part of monstrulio sexuality is like kind of i mean not obviously not the same uh, but it's like very mm. very different story um but yeah i don't know it's an interesting like exploration of like what is what 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 is sexuality and like what 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 part of it is like a like attraction to a specific like kind of person or or body or personality and what like where 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 is the line between that and like something um you know more more bizarre like wanting to uh, like torture or or uh, do I don't do things that um, you're like not or are are intentionally harmful. It's funny you mentioned it's funny you mentioned Monster Leo because there's a part where Ko Chan describes like getting pleasure from fantasizing about eating a young man alive, um, and, like eating his heart. <laughs> and that's definitely very Monster Leo. Yes. That's funny you call that out. <laughs> and I guess I'll ask you, what do you think of stories like this where you're really learning about the events of this character's life through his thoughts as opposed to through dialogue or through interactions with other people? Like, do you think this, do you think that in this story, like, hinders the story at all or, like, helps us, like, understand Cochin on a deeper level? Like, what do you think of that? Um, I think it helps us understand him on a deeper level, but I think for me, and this this is one of my biggest notes, which is a little bit hypocritical because, I mean, this is, I don't know, it feels like very, like, normal, like, um, 
I, I don't want to say normal trains of thought. Some of the things that he's like thinking are are not normal, but like the um like like the sort of like structure in and flow and things being like a little bit like disconnected or all over the place um, or like rambling and then coming back to something, um, you know, feel, feels like a way that a lot of people like think and operate uh, and um, gives us like a good understanding of who Ko Chan is as a person. But in terms of it, like creating a like coherent, understandable story, I don't know that it it really does that in the way that it, um, is I, I don't want to say like even satisfying story doesn't need to be satisfying um, to like get get its point across, but I I don't know it, it left me wanting something a little a little bit different or um, maybe I don't even want to say more more polished, but just like differently differently assembled in terms of structure. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, like I said earlier, I think we need to understand that Kochan is probably not a reliable narrator. Um, and I think knowing that, it kind of hinders the story for me, too. It just, knowing that a lot of what he's saying may not be true, or at least may not be fully true, it's like I don't really know how much I can connect with the story, understanding that. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean, yeah. also, I'm not sure how interested I am in books that are told solely through a character's mind as opposed to, like, things actually happening in the story. Yeah. Um, because the book, to me, read very much like this is an older version of Ko-Chan reminiscing on his life um, and kind of, like, telling us, oh, here's what happened here and here and, you know. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It didn't help me, but it does give us a better understanding of Coach Han. You're right there, but not something I would love to do again in a story. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. I mean, I, I I will say at the end of the day, like, this is, I, I think for a couple reasons, this is probably not a story I would have gravitated towards. But mm -hmm. um, for for me, there is a lot of value. And again, like, I even admit I was, like, sort of, like, trudging through that last part of the as a story, but there there is a lot of value in understanding the different ways that people tell stories, um, and that I think mm -hmm. for me at the end of the day is like the biggest the biggest takeaway from this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same here. I know I we 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 touched on it a little bit earlier in the meeting, but uh, do you think this book could be used or could? could be used to push the narrative that homosexuality is this like sexual deviance or like dark perversion uh unfortunately yes yeah <laughs> um which like i know like it can't it can't all be perfect and there are plenty of stories mm -hmm. the other way around um but <laughs> uh yeah i i do think it just like a lot of it gives people an you know an excuse to like you know demonize queerness um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's not that's not what we what we need but um i mean queer people come in all all shapes and colors and sizes and mental states and um levels of good and evil and like <laughs> differing, differing versions of sanity so um like from, I think at the time, like this is probably not the story that was needed, but like as part of a larger, a larger collection of queer stories, uh, like this, this is an important, an important piece to include. Like it can't all be like, like nice memoirs. Like I, I had a troubled childhood. I like couldn't find love and everything ended up being perfect. Um, mm. So uh, to the very long way of answering your question, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, I agree. I mean, I think like I mentioned earlier, I've even read like reviews from the fifties and sixties of this book and yeah. they all are, agree that this book like makes homosexuals look evil, which at yeah. the time was great for them because that was the narrative being pushed. Um, 
And I guess uh, another part of me is wondering, could he have gotten, he being the author Yuki Mishima, could he have gotten away with writing this book if he portrayed a happy queer character? Like, would he have even been able to publish that story? Um, I think it kind of only works if you portray the homosexuality as bad. Uh, I didn't even think about that as like maybe like a uh, I don't I don't want to say marketing ploy but like mm-hmm. maybe yeah uh, like a a survival tactic like how do you get your story told is by making making sure it's sensational enough to, mm-hmm. to be out there even if it's not uh, not really possible. Especially, I think, in his own culture, I don't even, I, again, I don't know what it was like at that time period for queer people, but I just do, I find it hard to believe you could have, you would have been able to write a, like, call me by your name sort of story in Japan in the 1940s. Um, yeah. I don't think that would have happened. <laughs> I don't think it would have worked. Yeah. And I guess one of my final questions is, considering who Yukio Mishima was in real life, you know, being looked at uh, pretty, pretty um, across the board, being looked at as this like fascist. He was a Japanese Japanese nationalist, uh, very right wing conservative individual, but also being looked at as being a queer icon, especially in the Japanese community. I'm curious, how much work do you think we need to do as readers of his work? Uh, to separate the art from the artist? Or is it possible to kind of hold space for both his art and who he was as an artist and still enjoy his work as a queer person? Um, it's a hard question. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, I can go first if you need time to think. That's, that's a tough one. <laughs> well, I was, I'm just thinking so much of this is also influenced by the time period. Like, I wonder, would he be the same person? I mean, I'd, he obviously wouldn't be the same person, but like some, some of those ideals may not be um, you know, so prevalent if he was you know, not, not in Japan in the time period he was in, if it was not like during a, you know, during during a global war. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, in in this case, I think it's important to like remember where the art is coming from, but to like mm-hmm. still be able to enjoy it and find value in it um, without. Uh, like, I, I don't, I don't, obviously, I'm not, not supporting some of those things. We know that they're not, they're not good things. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, losing my train of thought a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, how, do, how do you answer this question when it's about something different? Like, when it's about music and like uh mm-hmm. azalea banks boiling boiling her cat um but also making, yeah like, like really really <laughs> good songs like where 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 do we draw the line in modern day because i feel like it's it's much much easier to do it in a situation like this where we know that we have like progressed past some of mm-hmm. some of these uh ideals mm-hmm. yeah i'm definitely there with you i mean i don't think i have a a complete answer yet, and I've been thinking about this question for like two weeks. I mean, if I can be honest, um, this is a book I wanted to read in the club for a little bit, but because I wasn't sure how we could separate the art from the artist, I held off for so long. Um, I just wasn't sure if should should we be reading work by someone who may or may not have been queer. I'm not going to debate his queerness, um, but I think across the board is considered to be queer, except for by his wife. She's the only one who's like, no, he was totally straight. But of course, a wife would say that. I mean, I don't know. But <laughs> um, I was like, should we be reading works by someone like this? But at the same time, like you mentioned earlier, you know, all queer stories matter. Um, and 
even though this story definitely does not ring true for me, and I don't think it rings true for you either, uh, for someone it might. Um, yeah. So it's good for them. Uh, and yeah, it's funny yeah. earlier, you mentioned that like queer people come in like, you know, evil shapes and sizes and stuff. Um, because y- Yukio Mishima, he's published in this book called, I can't remember the author, but the book is called Bad Gays Throughout History. Um, where it just like lists <laughs> it just like lists all the worst gay people in the entire world and he's I think like number he's in there he's he's a high number um and yeah and he like I don't know how much how much of the articles he read that I put in the discord but towards the end of his life he had this like alt-right all-male sex cult essentially um and I guess that's where a lot of his queer iconography comes from, because he was one of the few people of that time period who was saying, actually, homosexuality is purely nature. Um, but at the same time, with that thought, he said that all men must be homosexual. And if you're not, you're mentally weak and women are inferior and women are distractions. And so it's like, ugh. <laughs> well, I kind of want to be on your side a little bit, Yukio Mishima. Part of me is like, you're totally losing me with the rest of that stuff. Um, yeah. So I I don't know, <laughs> but like like you do mention earlier, I I am very curious what a lot of these same thoughts and emotions around queerness or around relationships with women or all these things would they have still been prevalent in his life had he existed in this time period, where life for queer people is obviously much different than it was in the forties fifties. Um, that's a great question. Unfortunately, he didn't live to see it, but, uh, you know, nice to imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I guess my final question, I, I think I know your answer to this, but I'll ask you anyway, just for laughs. Would you be interested in reading uh, a loose sequel to this? There is one he wrote. <laughs> Would you want to read it? Um, I don't know. I was looking uh, at some some of the uh things that talk about like his other works or how there are like similarities between this and his other works um and just like it made me it made me a little curious i it would it would be a struggle for me if the writing style is the same i'm gonna say <laughs> it probably is um I, I that would be a struggle for me and this one was short it was like less than 200 pages um mm-hmm. Actually, also, I fell asleep reading this book multiple times, like like in the <laughs> in the middle of the day, just because like I could not wrap my head around what was going on. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, which is not not normal for me. Um, but I, I think that part would be a struggle. I would have to be really really intentional about it. But um, I I would be interested for the sake of like ab- absorbing more 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 stories and styles and seeing seeing what else um he has to say <laughs> i don't i don't know if i would enjoy it but i would i would try it mm-hmm. well I, I guess i will say uh that this book even though it's one of his most like important it's looked at as being one of his worst in terms of the writing and the prose um, many people who are huge fans of his put this book very, very low, but put his later works, which the, the loose sequel is a much later work in his life, they put that as being much better. Uh, there's more of a strict plot. The writing is much better, more fluid. Um, I am curious, though, how that works with the translation, because, again, we would, of course, be reading a translated version, not the original. Um, so I don't know how much of that would work in the translation, but yeah. Yeah. I think I would be somewhat interested, uh, I guess, to kind of tell you the plot of the Loose sequel. It's essentially, well, it is about an an aging uh, gay writer like Yukio Mishima, uh, who is stuck in a loveless heterosexual marriage. Um, and he develops this, like, weird revenge plot with this, like, young gay man who is, like, openly gay and, like, you know, having gay sex and all this kind of stuff. Uh, to, like, get back at his wife. Uh, the book synopsis didn't totally make sense to me, but that's what I gathered from it. Um, yeah. 
So, I mean, I have some of the interest. We're obviously not going to read it anytime soon. Yeah. Um, the, but, plot, the plot sounds interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he, interestingly enough, has a lot of these, like, revenge, jilted lover stories. Um, so I don't know what that's about. But that's, like, a lot of his later work is very much jilted lover. I'm going to take you down and kill you kind of vibe. <laughs> Interesting. So his poor wife must have been in hell with him. <laughs> um, <laughs> if that's the kind of person he was. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that is yeah. the end of my notes. And I think oh, I also also I'll say it's funny that you mentioned falling asleep to the book because typically I tend to yeah. read I read out loud mostly um, but I tend to read like a few chapters in one sitting with this I would read like five pages and then be okay that's enough like I can't take much more because yeah. um, it was really really dense um, but yeah anyway that's the end of my notes as always do you have any <laughs> Lingering thoughts, questions, comments, concerns, characters, plot points, anything? Um, no, just looking looking through some and nothing. This is not really like anything to add. Um, just looking through my notes and screenshots. There's literally I just thought this was so funny. Um, and more like on the reliable narrator. There's a part where he's talking about Omi and he's like, mm-hmm. I I never would apply the word love or say that I was in love. And literally five pages later. He yeah, said, yeah, I, yeah. I was in love with her. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, but this that just made me laugh. Yeah, there's a few times in the book where he definitely contradicts himself, like just pages later. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, I'm just very curious, is that a fault of the translator or is that like what the actual book says? I guess with that, I'm also curious just how much freedom do translators have? I always assumed a a translator's job is to literally translate word for word, but I guess not. Um, Well, I I think the, I mean, I just know, know from work, because we had a discussion about this earlier this week, actually, Mm -hmm. um, is that when we use services that translate word for word, we lose a lot of context mm-hmm. um which is the reason that we have we have like a real people that translate and add in mm-hmm. add in like the little the little little bits and details or additional words um or or take words out uh to help things like make more make more sense um mm-hmm. so i don't i don't know how much of that we got or didn't get and that also just another note on the translation that makes so much a lot of stuff make more sense to me because there's like a point where uh, well, several points where he like has writings from earlier in his uh, like childhood, and I'm like, this is a mm-hmm. terrible poem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it been, but also, like, I'm really oh, it's a child wrote it in Japanese, so it's not been translated to English. Um, yeah, so that, that probably is why. Speaking of poems, that like five page long poem about Saint Sebastian, I was like, that's what the one I'm talking that? about. Yes. Like, what the <laughs> hell am I reading? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, if we can close the discussion on this book. Um, we obviously have another meeting in two weeks, so I'm not going to talk about the book, but I am curious, uh, A, for the month of July, would you like to have two meetings again, or would you like to go back to one? And then B, depending on your answer to the first question, what genre or genres would you want to read next month? That the way you can kind of have a little bit of choice and we read next month. Yeah. Um, I, I would like two meetings again. Uh, mm-hmm. And I don't, I haven't like pulled any resources here. And it's funny because I've like, there are five or six books that like I, I've read and enjoyed, or I've like went to go add them to the list, um, but there are already 189 books on our list and every single one of yeah, them that's that's that is already on there. Um, oh, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> They're, they're like five or six where I've gone to add and I'm like, oh, they're already here. Um, <laughs> but I think that I, um, I, I don't know about essays, but I still, I'm like more, more curious about other, and maybe this is like where I can do some homework and try and like come with some resources. Um, some like other, other forms of, uh some like other other forms of writing mm-hmm. 
I, I would definitely be curious to explore, but I don't have any specific um, genres or, or anything like that at the moment. Uh, I would appreciate, I think, um, you know, we've like hit on a lot of different um, like cultural and racial groups. And I think mm -hmm. there are some that we like haven't really touched on that might be nice to explore. Mm -hmm. um, or just like help help uh, get get a better view of like the like queer queer POC experience. Um, I don't know that we've really done any more like uh, like middle Middle Eastern or or like Muslim or Arab leaning things. I don't think we've done any like indigenous American things either. Um, so those are both like on my on my list of things that I would like to like read read and discuss um i know we've done a lot of asian things a lot of african-american things uh several several more like latino things but mm -hmm. those those are those are things that are on my list at some point okay okay it's funny you mentioned that uh, the different ethnic groups because i i tend to try and save like certain stories for like heritage months like for example uh, September is Latin History. Sorry, it's uh, Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, and I was Latin thinking history. we could read. Oh, no. <laughs> what did you say? I'm sorry. No, I was, I was just teasing you a little bit. I said oh. Latin <laughs> History Month. <laughs> uh, and then November is uh, American Indian Heritage Month. So I was kind of, I guess, saving those stories for then. But we can obviously read them when it's not the Heritage Months. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll do that, and then. I was thinking from, I guess, my own personal interest, uh, I kind of want to read a crime thriller next month. I don't know. No. Would you be into that? Yes. Okay, cool. It's, it's actually the story that I, we talked about briefly on Discord, uh, where I was like, it's about a a straight father solving his gay son's murder. Do you remember that discussion we had briefly? I think so, yeah. Yeah, that story is one I want to read next month um so that's one and i know earlier you mentioned a few months ago actually i think you mentioned uh wanting to read historical fiction i found a couple um and i was thinking maybe the crime thrill the crime thriller and then um a historical fiction that sounds okay. good yeah i like okay. that okay cool I'm tempted to spoil the surprise, but I also want to wait. So I'll announce the names of the books at our next meeting. <laughs> okay, I'll wait because I don't, I don't want to get too excited and then start looking into them and then not. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of my thing too. Is like once I get my mind on a book, I want to like read all the reviews. I want to like listen to the author discussions that are available on YouTube and like kind of sample the book. And I'm like, okay, I'm getting way too ahead of myself. Yeah. Um, so yeah. We'll just wait on that. <laughs> well, before we go, do you have any final thoughts, questions, concerns about the book, about anything else, the club? Um, no, no, no thoughts, questions, concerns. Uh, okay. You know, as always, thank you for doing all the work to organize and coming prepared with excellent questions and uh, good conversation. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thanks for bringing your excellent thoughts to my excellent questions. <laughs> okay, well, I will see you in two weeks to discuss uh, The Love of Singular Men by Victor Herringer. Yes. Okay. Bye-bye, Michael. Bye, Jonathan. <laughs>